Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our first town hall of 2023. And what a way to start this year. Um, not with storms and the weather, but with our presenter today. My name is Jesus Ramirez Valles, as Rachel said. I'm professor and chief of prevention science at the Department of Medicine here at the University of California, San Francisco. Yesterday, we commemorated the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King, and today is our National Day of Racial Healing. It is on this context that I welcome our wonderful speaker. Our speaker is a national and international leader of public health, an infectious disease physician, and importantly, an activist. Dr. Dimitri Daskalakis is a deputy coordinator for the White House National Impulse Response. Before this job, Dr. Daskalakis served locally and nationally as a leader in public health as the director for the Division of HIV Prevention at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, and also as a deputy commissioner for the Division of Disease Control and assistant commissioner for the Bureau of HIV at the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Notably, and the reason why I admire his work is because Dr. Daskalakis is recognized internationally as an expert in HIV prevention and has focused much of, much of his career on the treatment and prevention of HIV and other STIs as an activist physician with a focus on the LGBTQ communities. Some ground rules, um, I will pass next the microphone to Dr. Daskalakis. After his presentation, we will open up the space for questions. Please submit your questions during the presentation using the chat function. Rachel and I, Rachel and I will be monitoring and grabbing those questions and present them at the end. The presentation is being recorded and will be made public in a couple of days. Dr. Daskalakis, thank you for joining us. The microphone is yours. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity uh, to speak to you. So I want to thank you. And I'll also say um, I'm sending you all of uh, you know great wishes, given all of the events in California and all of the weather. I will also give you greetings from Bob Fenton, who is actually in California dealing with some of these urgencies. So uh, he is uh, he is uh, back in sort of that work while also doing the MPOX work. So um, he um, will always tend to introduce himself as a fifth generation San Franciscan. So I will do that for him and, and send you a, a warm hello as you all um, are dealing with some really, uh, really heavy, important things. So with that, I will uh, talk a bit about MPOX. I will conjure Bob wherever I can since he's such a fantastic partner. Um, so what I'm going to do today is really start by talking a bit <clears throat> about the syndemic perspective and really um, defining that. So I think people who are working in the HIV space um, can probably define syndemic for themselves, but just so we're on the same page. Then I'll talk a bit about how MPOX has joined the syndemic <clears throat> and really look at it as a brief case study, then move into an update on MPOX, where we are today, and at least for a moment land on a way forward, thinking that most likely you will also have some great ideas on the way forward uh, that may inspire us to calibrate our work both in MPOX and beyond as we uh, transition um, into really um, a, a more robust strategy to address syndemics. <clears throat> So I'll start with a simple definition of what is a syndemic. So um, they're interacting epidemics that are made worse or potentiated by, um, by social determinants of health. So they're epidemics that interact with each other and by that interaction increase their adverse effects on the health of communities that face systematic, structural, or other inequities. And when we think about syndemics um, at CDC, so I'll put that hat on for a moment, we really think about four very important domains that need to come together to be, to be able to effectively address these interacting epidemics. So the first is a focus on people. So it's really starting not about a disease or a silo of funding or opportunity, but rather uh, what do people need and what do they need to be able to optimize their health, especially given um, the uh, synergistic effect of epidemics as well as the uh, social determinants that, uh, that, that propel them into a syndemic. Where are the places where we can find people and where are the places where we can interact with them 
on their own terms? How can we optimize those places to achieve uh, infectious disease goals, but also address their concerns that um, are those really social determinants concerns that often hinder our ability to move forward? How can we bring science in? So where are there opportunities, whether it is a public health science, behavioral science, or as was the case with, uh, with MPOX, all of the above, like basic science and clinical trial science, how can we weave that together in a way that has an awareness not only for one infection, but for multiple infections and how they interact together and how they interact with those social determinants? And how can public health policy levers be pulled to allow for all of these things to happen? So when I think about our MPOX response, I tend to say there are components that were critical in being able to do this. And we talk about three, but they actually overlap with these four, demonstrating how it's so similar. The first is um, science. So how can we accelerate science? How can we look at science to, ins to inspire what we do and move things in directions that make sense? community engagement and meaningful engagement with the community. How can we bring people into the story, not just organizations, but also people who experience this at the edge? And then lastly, political will. And that's, I think, a combination of place and policy. So how can we sort of generate the political will to be able to move forward a response? Those have been our guiding stars. And I'll tell you, um, before I get into the meat of this, one of the most inspiring things that happened to me as uh, in my time at the White House was getting to meet with the president um, on our very first day. And I'm used to meeting with folks um, that uh, talk about outbreak responses um, since I've gotten to be participate in many of them now. And it starts with how can we make the epi curve better? And um, when the leader of the free world looks at you and says, how can we make that LGBTQ AI plus community understand that we care about them and are concerned about what's happening? That was our first sentence from him. And then we talked about the outbreak, which I think really talks about the sort of people first strategy um, that really gets us to where we need, as opposed to worrying about siloed and, and siloed ideas and siloed infections and thinking about things in isolation rather than in an ecosystem that requires Again, science, political will, and meaningful community engagement to achieve the end. So what I mean by that is we need to put people first, and part of that means finding folks where they are. In HIV, I think we've all, uh, we all bristle at the words that that is a community that's hard to find because that's not true. The community finds us every day. We just have to open our eyes, ears, and hearts to be able to bring them into the mix. Focusing on equity from the beginning, not waiting for this to be a side effect, but saying like, how can we increase equity because we know it's going to be a problem. And that was the other thing that he charged us with at the outbreak response, which is make sure we pay attention to what's happening with black and brown people, since it is inevitable that this is going to be overrepresented among them. Again, those words, the president's not mine. Um, put your money where your epidemic is. And I'll say when there isn't money to put where your epidemic is, leverage what you have to be able to come up with a strategy that addresses how an outbreak break is actually functioning in the real world, the important leverage policy levers, like identify ways to sort of address things that seem to be barriers, but what policy changes can you do to sort of approach things in a more holistic, whole person strategy um, that uh, addresses, again, what an epidemic or an outbreak looks like in real time, in real world, as opposed to like a single siloed epi curve that you're following. And then also prioritize innovation, like figure out ways that science can be plugged into what we do in an effective way, even in an outbreak response so that you can move things forward uh, more efficiently and um, with, um, with, again, rigor in terms of, of your interventions that you're able to discuss with community. So I'll say one of, uh, one of our Division of HIV Prevention models of syndemic work is the status neutral HIV prevention and care um, cycle that we talk about frequently. And this is really the idea of how can you bring HIV treatment and prevention together by addressing all of the things that people need and kissing them with prevention regardless of status. So I think that that lesson um, from the HIV universe we pulled into the MPOX response and potentially create a model to emulate not only for chronic infectious diseases, but also for acute infectious diseases, which is it's not just about the one condition. It's not about the one test. It's not about the one vaccine. It's about putting it in the context of a syndemic. And when you see a syndemic, don't just treat one thing, address it with syndemic strategy. So not only describe it, but also move heaven and earth where possible so that you address it in the context that, in which it exists. 
which is a great transition to talk about how MPOX has joined our syndemic. So a little graphic to describe what I'm talking about. In a moment, I'm going to share data that you are probably all too familiar with about how MPOX has interacted with HIV STI as well as other, um, other um, epidemics, including epidemics of drug use and mental health issues. So this is how it starts. There are interactions that occur across um, domains, diseases, et cetera. But then what happens is the social determinants of health come together and they, in effect, take these pieces of matter and compress them tightly into a ball that we're going to call a syndemic. And that becomes a greater mass, has a greater force. And by the combination of the inherent biological interactions that may happen with infectious diseases, then potentiated by these social determinants, this comet becomes stronger and bigger, and the impact that they can have on affected communities is way greater. So in order to address this endemic, you cannot just address the, uh, the components of the comet. You have to address the pressures that are making it into a diamond, that are making it into what is actually a more, a more challenging um, interaction of conditions and diseases um, to the community, and then ultimately to public health. So that happened with MPOX. And here is some really good data from an, from an MMWR that was published in September that showed what we were seeing um, in real time on the ground. So again, we know that uh, from these data and then many more data points since then, the people who were diagnosed with MPOX were a part of this syndemic. 38% of individuals at this point in these jurisdictions, eight matched jurisdictions, um, that had a, a, a known infection of HIV at the time of their MPOX diagnosis. 41% had an STI in the year prior to their MPOX diagnosis. And when you put it all together, over 60% of them either had an HIV or STI. So that those sort of components of, of that syndemic, you can see how they're coming together. So you see that there is like this interaction. It's a similar community. The infections are traveling together. And so that's the, the first signal that we had that this was moving as a syndemic. So let's treat it like a syndemic. We then got deeper, and what we found was, as we move forward, that HIV and MPOX, in fact, had a, a very clear syndemic interaction. And the first was what seemed to be a biological interaction, but everyone who does HIV knows, no such animal, that the biology and the social determinants of health are hand in hand together. So this is, I think, our first data signal that was published that showed that this was happening on the ground. So we knew that people with MPOX and HIV were more likely to report severe symptoms. We also know that people People who had that co-infection were more likely to be hospitalized than people who did not have HIV, so over two times uh, the, the rate. And then it gets deeper. You look at people who are less connected to care. So people with a detectable viral load had some more severe symptoms and were three times more likely to be hospitalized than, than, the, than the group of people living with HIV and nine times more hospitalized than individuals uh, that did not have HIV. Then we looked at, at, at level of immunosuppression and the cutoff that was looked at was 350 T cells. And so more data coming in a moment, but individuals with T cells lower than 350 were twice as likely to be uh, hospitalized than, than, than all comers with HIV and five times more likely than people without HIV. And then the data that is not necessarily a surprise to those of us who work in HIV, but definitely was really important in uh, gluing together so much of our work in uh, and sort of approaching this uh, with a syndemic lens. Uh, MMWR released in October shared information about the 57 cases that we were consult or people that we were consulted on with severe disease um, at the CDC. And so these are the bone chilling uh, pieces of information that came, that 82% had HIV, the others had other immunocompromising conditions, 72% with CD4 count less than 50. So I had to keep asking if that was a typo, but it's not. So we, we're talking about a large number of people who had CD4 cell counts less than 50, like a time machine to 1992. Um, less than 9% were on HIV medications. That's 9% were on HIV medications, meaning 91% were not. 68% Black and 23% homeless. And these people were overrepresented in deaths as well. We had a syndemic. Treat it like a syndemic. 
And so here's how it looked from the perspective of a real world response to trying to weave together a syndemic response. We're not gonna say that it's perfect, but given the sort of resources that we had, what we did was stimulate um, flexibility among many agencies that were a part of that syndemic response structure. So the first was Ryan White that made it clear that Ryan White resources could be used to address MPOX, and that included things like paying administration fees for vaccine, covering treatment if necessary, whatever it took. Followed by CDC that um, released what is, I think, a pretty uh, groundbreaking letter that allowed um, HIV and STI resources from all of their uh, major grant programs to be used to address MPOX because MPOX related work is HIV prevention and HIV prevention is MPOX related work. So it's all in the line of the same effort. So this is, I think, a historic, a very important historical document because those flexibilities are not things that we see every day. It then gets deeper. We went to SAMHSA and SAMHSA actually allowed flexibility for their drug use with their drug user health resources, as well as other mental health resources to work to identify folks who could benefit from uh, MPOC services and use um, those resources to navigate them there. And then given what we were learning about homelessness um, among people who had severe MPOX, um, we, we worked with HUD and HOPWA very closely to create funding flexibility and resource flexibility that allowed resources, including some COVID resources, to be used to house individuals who needed it for isolation or quarantine, and also use HOPWA resources to identify people out of care to bring them in care, since a point of entry from the housing perspective is so different than a point of entry that you would experience coming down the HRSA path or CDC path. So it was a, how could we use that entry point to um, really address the core issue, which is uncontrolled, undiagnosed HIV um, that, that then resulted in people having very severe outcomes of their MPOX. So again, lesson is, if it is a syndemic, if you see it as, in, as a syndemic, we need to work to address it using syndemic tools. So I will step away from the syndemic conversation and give you a little bit of view about where we are with MPOX today. And we're gonna end again with syndemics where we're gonna sort of say what, uh, what the direction should be. And then I hope to hear from you about what we can do um, better to sort of stimulate that even further in the future. So I'll start by talking about where we are with the epidemiology of cases. And this is a, as of January 11th, um, and you can see that we have um, just under 30,000 cases. That's going to change soon, I would imagine, when the data are updated, although maybe not immediately this week. Um, we've also seen 21 deaths. Um, the darker the uh, jurisdiction, uh, darker blue, the more cases that have been identified in those jurisdictions. So you can see um, what uh, the MPOX distribution looks like. This is our epi curve. And again, remember um, the inspiring moment is how can we make the community um, uh, understand that we care about them? And the side effect of that is the epi curve comes down because we listen to what they said. Um, and so like going back to the epi and back to the epi curve, um, we are 99% uh, reduction from the peak of the outbreak in terms of what we're seeing in cases. Um, you know, there will be ditzels and blips, but the last um, the last view of this epi curve, we had uh, four cases per day in the United States, um, which compares favorably to something well over 400 um, on average. <clears throat> Looking at the r not. Um, that has been generated by um, forecasters at CDC. Um, you can see again um, where we are. Um, again, an R not below uh, one, an effective reproductive number below one means that we have a shrinking outbreak. So you can see that um, we are we are below one and continue to be forecasted below one. Um, long tail likely to be seen in terms of what we're seeing and the risk of future uh, introductions, but ultimately continue to see the outbreak driving towards zero. Uh, in terms of gender identity and age, um, we are, this is actually on the CDC website, so you can see this um, easily. Um, the belly of the outbreak is in that 31 to 35 range. You can see that there's folks who are on both sides of youth as well as, um, as slightly older, um, but the middle is about 31 to 35. <clears throat> the vast majority, 95.3% are cisgender men. Cisgender women represent just under 3% of, of, of people with MPOX. Trans men, about 0.2%, trans women, 0.8%, and folks who 
identify with another gender identity about 0.7%. So again, a phenomenon that is primarily seen among cisgender men, um, though the data level for this got smaller and smaller because of reporting issues. <clears throat> many of these uh, cisgender men are thought to be gay, bisexual, other MSM or two-spirited folks um, who were diagnosed with MPOX. Um, looking at the race ethnicity, again, there's no, no better way to address equity by ending an outbreak and getting it to zero. But on the way there, we have definitely seen that the outbreak has been concentrating among Black and Latino individuals. Remember, the numbers get very, very small at the end. But nevertheless, you can see a trend where this um, started as a mainly white outbreak and then became a mainly an outbreak that mainly affected Black, Indigenous, and other people of color. So um, again, not surprising. Um, this is HIV and fast forward in terms of what we saw um, in the 80s. Um, I'll also highlight that um, that we have uh, we continue to see a great um, capacity in testing. And so I think um, one of the important lessons from COVID, I think, is moving testing into commercialization fairly quickly. And, and though it would be great to be even faster, about a month and a half after cases were identified, we were able to get um, testing into commercial laboratories. Uh, we had a, a capacity of around 6,000 tests per week nationally through the Laboratory Response Network, or LRN, mainly public health labs. And now we have a capacity of 80,000 which thankfully we are not even getting close to uh, because there's not as many lesions to test by any stretch of the imagination, which is great news. Um, you can see again, all of the diminishing numbers in terms of uh, positivity. And so we monitor this um, right now to make sure that we know what's happening. That looks like the trend is continuing and the capacity remains good. So I'm gonna move on to talking about vaccination, which has been such a important piece of the story here. And again, this is, I think, a lesson in science, engagement, and community um, and, and political will, because all three of these had to come into play to be able to get us where we are today, where I can say that we are not um, experiencing supply constraints uh, uh, in terms of our projected need in populations who could benefit from vaccine. <clears throat> so we um, have a very transparent view of what is happening in the U.S. with the with vaccine supply of the Janeos vaccine. Um, we, um, for the community, were asked to be very transparent with what was ordered, where it was, and what was happening. Every week we update this infographic. It's on Asper's website that makes sure that folks know like what we have in the pipeline in terms of ordered vaccine, um, as well as what distribution looks like nationally, as well as administration. So remember, um, if you were doing your math and say, wait, the vials and doses don't match. Well, again, you'll remember that we've done uh, intradermal dosing, which is an example of uh, really leading with science and then working as hard as we can to engage community to not only sort of address the need to move to this, but also to calibrate how we're doing intradermal vaccination to be responsive to the needs of the folks we serve. So 900,000 doesn't mean doesn't equal 1.16 because within three weeks of announcing the intradermal um, emergency use authorization, over 80% of the country was administering intradermal vaccines exclusively. So that's very exciting and shows that public health can be very nimble and responsive, even to pretty big changes in, uh, in implementation um, strategy. Um, so as I said, we continue to work to increase vaccine administration in the U.S. Um, the wonderful surge of, uh, of uh, vaccine interest that we had um, followed by the surge in vaccine availability um, ha, um, is really important and, and probably one of the factors along with natural immunity and temporary behavior change that were really important in um, driving the outbreak down. But as you can see, um, we are seeing a definite softening of interest and demand in the vaccine. <clears throat> Um, with both first and second doses um, decreasing pretty consistently um, as cases also dwindle. Um, we continue to see disparities in vaccine administration, which actually have tightened compared to the, the, the first days of vaccination. So the majority of doses have gone into white non-Hispanic arms 
And um, despite the fact that we're that Black and Hispanic folks are overrepresented in the outbreaks, so the disparity being that that those proportions don't match. Like the percentage of of cases that were among Black and Hispanic people compared to vaccines. So definitely, though it's close to representative of the population, it's not representative of the outbreak. And so that's where the work is. And you can see that we have seen progress comparing earlier phases of vaccine to later. But this has really been one of the central aspects of the work that we're doing in vaccine and vaccine equity since the beginning of vaccination, but certainly <clears throat> when we moved into a more prep-focused stance, uh, and we'll talk about that briefly. Um, another really important thing that we did with vaccination was we used behavioral methodology to look at the state of vaccine confidence for the MPOX vaccine. So excuse some of the slides historically saying monkeypox, like we know the name has changed, but we have it. some of the historical documents remain monkeypox. So, uh, so again, that's a whole other story for another day, but really excited that that name change happen. Um, long and the short of it is we took a look at through a very rigorous methodology of where our gaps were that were getting in the way of folks' interest in vaccine and confidence. It had to do about messaging about MPOX. It had to do about messaging about vaccine, the request for more transparency about how decisions were made. As an example, the FDA put up a, a, a first of kind one pager that talked about its thought process behind the EUA, which I think is really exciting uh, and hopefully a pattern for the future. Um, but then also data about vaccine effectiveness and performance, data about safety, um, really a call to get that out as fast as we can. And I think that we were able to do a lot and uh, and sort of in that vein. So, you know, I think that in September, we were able to release really early performance data that showed that individuals with a single dose of the vaccine um, were about 14 times less likely to get uh, back to get um, MPOX and individuals with one dose or with no doses. Um, and then it was followed up by more data that was published in December through October. So the data that went out through another month to October 1st, 2022. So that means we actually had more second doses under our belt. And what we found was that the first dose effect shrank and that the second dose was actually related with almost a tenfold decrease in, um, in folks getting MPOX. This was using data based on surveillance across the country. So it's looking at surveillance data. So it doesn't take into account some behavioral changes and some other factors, but a really important view into vaccine performance. Subsequently, real VE data um, that is not just performance, but real vaccine effectiveness has also been published. This is uh, uh, data that looked at, um, at, at folks who were vaccinated in a case control study um, using EPIC. So looking across many EPICs to sort of identify uh, cases versus controls. And the big message is that uh, one dose works a bit, two doses are really good, and there appears to be a tendency that the intradermal vaccine may actually function a little bit better, at least in heterologous dosing. So this data is going to move forward, maybe slower than expected because we don't have as many cases for the case control to be able to sort of say more about what intradermal dosing to intradermal doses look like as opposed to just the heterologous. So again, Big picture a detail, 69% uh, VE. So uh, individuals vaccinated were were 69% uh, were less likely than unvaccinated people to get MPOX. Um, and so we also have other data that I actually didn't add the slide today for time that says that also vaccination may, may prevent hospitalization and then also may reduce some of the systemic uh, symptoms that people have. Trying to be directly responsive, moving this really quickly to get it out in an accelerated fashion. Same as safety data, we were able to use multiple different sources of safety data um, to share that we're not seeing a signal uh, of any significance. In fact, most of what we're seeing has to do with injection site reactions, and there didn't appear to be a large difference between sub-Q versus intradermal. Um, also, an important thing that the community said is that we need to expand access to vaccine. So by increasing supply, we were able to move from a post-exposure prophylaxis with some flourish plus plus uh, stance um, into a pre-exposure prophylaxis stance that really um, addresses not only um, proximal risk, but also potentially future risk um, and really increasing the circle of individuals who could be vaccinated, shouting out specifically commercial sex workers and sex partners of people at risk to make sure that we got deeper into the community who could benefit from the vaccine. We also heard loud and clear, um, not only from um, our confidence report, but also from talking to the community that there were some things in the way 
And one of them was a risk assessment. And so this is a page out of the HIV playbook. So you'll remember how we recently removed the need for a complex risk assessment for the use of HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis. That's been mirrored in MPOX. If someone asks for the vaccine, they do not need to be grilled in terms of their risk. They're able to just get the vaccine. We also heard that though the intradermal vaccine has been great in terms of extending access, it also caused um, some longer standing redness and potentially marks on people's skin that was potentially literally stigmatizing and disclosing potentially sexuality. Um, or gender identity. And so we worked with the FDA and the CDC based on this feedback to identify different body sites where the vaccine could be administered. So um, for some people that's under clothes, for some people it's not, but including the upper back as well as the shoulder and not just the forearm for intradermal administration. And because research has been a pivotal part of what we're doing, um, NIAD also introduced a clinical study that has fully recruited uh, to look at intradermal vaccination delivery compared to subcutaneous, looking both at safety as well as correlates of immunity. This one is going to be really interesting because they're also looking at not only the current intradermal dose, but a half dose of that dose. If there's still uh, immune uh, correlates of immunity that indicate the vaccine works at an even lower dose, and we'll also be following out people to see what happens with the uh, the skin reactions that they have. Um, most data indicating that uh, in another study that within a year they're all gone. But we're going to have that more prospectively from this one as well. Going to move on to treatment. That's tecoviramat or TPOX. Uh, I'm going to really focus on presenting the data from the expanded access IND um, from CDC and FDA. And I'll highlight what's happening with the STOP trial. So um, to date, around or since yet, up to January 11th, 6,743 people have been in uh, the EAIND with full data that, so we can report them out. Um, you can see that the uh, that the age distribution um, is almost identical to the age distribution I shared for the cases, um, as is the gender identity reported of individuals using uh, Tecoviramat through the expanded access IND. The, the racial uh, disparity um, in this group is actually less marked than what we see for vaccine. So when you look at the racial breakdown of individuals using the EAIND, it's very similar to what the cases look like, which is great news. There is still some disparity when you look at the black and Hispanic bars. Um, Hispanic folks are a bit overrepresented and black folks a bit underrepresented. But again, the gulf is a lot smaller than what we were seeing with vaccination. So that, that that's good news. Um, I'll also say that the STOP study um, is continuing. Um, there are multiple sites in the United States and also big news coming soon is that remote consenting is going to be available, which means that um, other sites um, that don't have the STOP trial will be able to uh, interact with STOP, style, uh, stop site study sites to be able to um, get uh, folks uh, enrolled. So again, um, really important that we shift folks in that direction because as the uh, numbers decrease in the US, um, we really need the opportunity to say, does Tecoviramat really work? We have lots of anecdote. Um, we have really good safety signal from the EAIND, but we actually don't have uh, randomized study trial data to tell us that it's working. Um, I'll also say that one of the really great things that we did during this um, outbreak, if you haven't seen it, there's sort of two pieces, is the release of a research agenda really early on in the outbreak, um, and then followed by a release of an inventory of all of the U.S. government supported research studies that are happening that focus on MPOX. So rather than trying to piece together from different places, we put them all in one and they're searchable. So you can say, I want to know what's happening in vaccine or vaccine effect you can put that in. This is going to be updated in real time uh, about quarterly to sort of make sure that we, we show what's happening in that area. And I think we are on the hook for having a community, uh, an open community uh, virtual meeting around research. It has not been forgotten for those of you who know that we talked about it. Um, we are working on it now and we'll be launching a plan, I think, in quarter one of 2023. So very exciting. Um, Again, that other piece of this, um, really community engagement um, and equity have been really critical in what we're doing. For those of us who are in the HIV world, we actually took up a really 
close look at the history of HIV and outbreak response and really said, what can we do here that's different than what we did um, before 41 years ago? And how can we do it better so that we are intentionally approaching this outbreak in a way to minimize stigma where possible uh, and really be very um, deliberate uh, in terms of how we did our communication and how we reach to the community. Um, I'll say that, um, that having lived this, um, there is an easy path and a hard path. And the easy path is to say, this is, and again, like I, I'm not saying this as like a quotable quote, but this is, you know, this is a gay disease. That's a really easy one-stop shop to actually uh, communicate to people and then create potentially decades of stigma. And so rather than doing that, we took the approach of let's talk about exposures, which exposures are associated with transmission of MPOX, and then work a hundred times as hard to make sure we get that information to trusted messengers and to trusted channels and trusted platforms that the community listens to so that we don't um, create a stigma. Governmental public health and public health in general, our primary mission should be to intentionally prevent stigma. And so this, I think, is an example. Again, not perfect, but definitely um, something that we took lessons right out of the HIV playbook to be able to um, move forward in MPOX. And I'll tell you one really um, important meeting that I remember is a very prominent HIV activist um, who sort of lived the days of the 80s and the 90s was pulled into a very early White House engagement. And it was heated because it was at the very beginning of the outbreak. And um, this, this individual ended the uh, presentation by saying, even though we're having heated discussions, imagine what would have happened if 41 years ago we had the same audience. So I think that that is um, one of the things that stuck with me and that really drove the MPOX coordination team to continue to move forward with really full throttle ahead on lots of engagements. And CDC, a lot of the other um, sort of players they had lots of engagements, but we at the White House had over 500 specific engagements that focus on community taken really broadly. Um, well, I'll also tell you that um, we did a couple of really innovative things. Um, one of them was to center equity from the beginning of our inception. So we brought Kay Hayes in um, from the um, OIDP, from the Office of the Assistant Secretary of Health, and um, she became our senior equity advisor. And then quickly thereafter engaged with uh, Admiral Levine to create a uh, monkey, an MPOX response virus workshop that drew mainly from Black, Indigenous, and other people of color from the LGBTQ community so that we could get individual level feedback of what was being experienced on the ground and then iterate that back into the response so that we could um, change how and what we were doing based on feedback from the people who were overrepresented um, in that work. So in, in the grand tradition of HIV, nothing about us without us at the table, we brought folks exactly to the table. And when we had individuals who were uh, particularly critical, we brought them into the meeting uh, to make sure that they were able to tell us in very clear terms what we needed to work on to do better. We are now up to our fifth engagement, our fifth monthly meeting with, um, with this group coming up fairly soon. Um, our outreach also worked uh, in sort of the public health arena as well as provider arena. One of the other wonderful things that CDC did among the many wonderful things was create uh, MPOX technical reports. So if you haven't seen them, they're a very deep dive into MPOX, the epidemiology, and then also forecasting. So we have like real time forecasting and, and, and uh, of what the MPOX um, outbreak could look like. That's where I got the are not to share with you. So we uh, were able to sort of share that and continue to share it in a way that really helped us uh, calibrate our response and communicate what we were doing. Science brief, and I think there's another one coming soon is a rumor on the street. Um, but science, science briefs about transmission, and then also our work to focus on uh, reaching out to providers of care, whether it's medical or other or service providers, um, so, so folks were aware of MPOX and how they could help. 
it didn't end there. Um, we heard from the community and we saw on the ground that we had to really work hard to create um, not only equity in everything that we did with the vaccine response, but also special equity focus to really accelerate um, vaccine on the ground. And what we did was create several types of equity pilot programs, large and small event equity pilots. I'm gonna focus on the large ones because um, they're sort of remarkable in terms of numbers, but I'll say the small ones are great and their communities a practice that are held where folks talk about what they've done on the ground, whether it's going to a house ball, to a leather bar, whatever it is. In fact, we did one this weekend at, in DC with Mid-Atlantic Leather, where we actually collaborated with a private company as well as DC Health to provide vaccines to many folks who were getting them in their local jurisdictions. Anyhow, in terms of these large um, events, um, we actually published MMWRs on two of them, one in Louisiana for Southern Decadence, where seven, about 7,000 uh, individuals were vaccinated um, during an, a period of, of work for that festival, and Atlanta Black Pride, where 4,200 people were vaccinated, and in a really great uh, demonstration of if you put vaccine closer to people and uh, that focuses on their communities, you will actually see great equity things happen. So over 70% of the vaccines that were administered were to people of color. I will also give the shout out to San Francisco because I never know what magical powers you have in San Francisco, but Castro and Folsom when put together did 10,000 vaccines. So um, congratulations on winning the large event award. I'm not surprised <laughs> given your history, um, but we did Oakland and a couple of other things and it was really um, a high yield. We also crowdsourced questions. We heard from the community that um, there were things that they needed to know about MPOX and about the vaccine. We went to our group of Black, Indigenous, and other people of color in our workshop. We went to others and we got about, I think it's like 17 questions. I can't remember the count. We got, we got uh, over 15 questions. I'll leave it at that. Um, and we recorded them in English and in Spanish to be able to address the questions. And they, they, are, they run the gamut from, do I need my second shot? Is it too late for my second shot? Um, how long am I immune from MPOX after I have the infection? Like all these things. Um, and so those are posted on CDC and also on um, HIV.gov. We engage partners through social media and have had some like really stellar successes through partner uh, engagement. Uh, one example was with Human Rights Campaign. We had one post go super viral with, uh, with now it's about half a million uh, likes and many, many views. So it really is uh, remarkable. Um, and so I wanna end, we talked a little bit about syndemics at the start. We talked about what it's like to sort of look at MPOX as a syndemic and to treat it as a syndemic. Then a little update about where we are today in that strategy. And I wanna land on the way forward. So again, like when you see a syndemic, um, when you identify this, I feel like, you know, in general thinking about how public health has worked, we talk a lot about syndemics, but do we really have syndemic level responses? Are we resourced to do this? And do we have flexibility and resources to be able to do it? And it does, it's not just about the infections, but also how can we collaborate outside of traditional public health to sort of aspects that touch the social determinants so that we can try to disaggregate this sort of tightened comet that's heading toward our community and try to really um, minimize uh, or at least alleviate some of the impact of these synergistic infections. Um, I think there's a lot of ideas in terms of how to go forward with syndemic strategy, which is how can we address the social determinants of health as the top priority to address syndemics, even if it's aspirational. We may not always hit it, but what if we make it number one? What if we deliver more people-centered services rather than just HIV prevention services, things that are really designed to serve as, that are service models or silos that may follow funding more than the reality of infections? How can we increase syndemic investments? That's as an idea in sexually sexual health clinics or STD clinics and harm reduction sites so that HIV uh, can expand its reach while also addressing the other needs of the community, including harm reduction needs. 
How can uh, we increase testing, linkage to care and treatment, not only for STI and MPOX in this case, but also HIV, viral hepatitis, mental health, housing issues, and substance use disorders? How can it be one package? How can it be that status neutral cycle um, that really addresses um, the things that people need as opposed to the things we think they need? And how can we better identify clusters and respond to them in real time in a way that is respectful to the needs um, of the community but also addressing the importance of disrupting uh, transmission when we find it. So I'll land back at this. It's about people. It's about place. It's about science and policy. So what are the levers that we can pull in all of these? How can we become more people first? How can we identify the places where we find the community every day, the community finds us, how can we optimize those and not worry about is it HIV or STD or viral hepatitis? How can we really address the science and bring it to people in a way that makes sense and is responsive to their needs and is communicated in a way that they understand? And then finally, what are our stops? What are the policy things that are getting in our way that we can really work on and change? The answer to some may be it's hard to do, it may take long, but if we don't start, we're never going to get to the end of that road to really achieve a place where we can um, have a systemic, a syndemic structure that not only addresses chronic infections like HIV, but can also be leveraged like we did for MPOX to respond to an acute threat. Thank you. I'll put my email address up front in case you all have other ideas that you want to send my way, and I'll, I'll hand it back to you all so we can move on to some questions. And I think I achieved the deliverable of 45 minutes, which is great. <laughs> thank you, thank you, much appreciated. Uh, very exciting as, as we all expected. I personally love your emphasis on two aspects, community engagement and stigma. Thank you for that. Um, I know we're in a particular place in San Francisco was very unique. Um, so it's, our response was a little different from the rest of the country. But we have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, that I want to address, and then I have a, a general question beyond impacts and HIV. Uh, one set of questions is about um, the biology and immunity of MPOX. What happens with, um, do we have reports of number one, reinfection after vaccination? And second, what are the, what have been the reports of the latest information regarding pre-exposure to vaccine, like many of us were vaccinated when we were kids, um, and then exposure to the virus later in our lives? Great, both great questions. Um, I will start by saying that, you know, the, that robust public health surveillance needs to be adequately resourced to be able to continue the work that we're doing in MPOX. CDC continues to look for um, reinfections. To date, we've not seen it. Again, I wouldn't be surprised if we do, um, given the fact that like people's immune systems may be potentially not um, necessarily as robust, depending on their underlying conditions. We have not heard reports thus far, but sort of active surveillance on this continues with the jurisdictions. So um, again, I would not be surprised if we hear something, but I, it's not something that we're hearing in any sort of frequency. Um, sort of following the smallpox model, um, the expectation is that uh, an individual with a natural infection should have some amount of immunity, like smallpox, the thought is that it's lifetime. We don't know for MPOX, so we're going to have to follow closely. Um, the second question has to do with prior exposure to other vaccine agents, Drivax, I think, as well as ACAM 2000, sort of the more traditional live, uh, at, at live attenuated viruses versus uh, live attenuated replicating viruses versus um, the Geneos vaccine, the MBA platform, which is a live attenuated non-replicating virus. So um, you're going to have to watch this space carefully. I think that there will be data coming in terms of what the, uh, the, the postulated vaccine effectiveness will be uh, for individuals who had prior vaccination. So I don't, I, I, I will say that that is a, you're gonna have to, I, I'm leaving you with a cliffhanger, but there will be some information about that. It, um, the current guidance I can tell you is that an individual with prior vaccination, if they are individuals put at risk for MPOX is still to get a dose of the MBA vaccine. Um, and so we will see what happens when sort of that data comes out. But um, watch that space, as I tend to say. Um, there's um, so there's there will be some data that will inform your question. 
Uh, thank you. Uh, reminded to the audience that we have a few minutes still to submit your questions. Um, uh, a member of the audience is asking about how can we move forward health equity um, or the equity response when we respond to skills of redundancy. So how can, can that be an afterthought, but rather how it can be a priority in a response? So I'll, I'll just give a little history first, and I'll say um, that when we, when the CDC started their response um, to MPOX, one of the first things that happened was an equity officer was identified, and equity was like part of the, res of, of the structure of their response. Soon after, it went from, um, we're monitoring this thing into this is a, a response in, in, in the sort of center that was leading it. So I'll start that it's really, the lessons learned from COVID are real. And I think that it's really important that like, you know, in this outbreak, sort of creating an equity sort of uh, individuals within the response with authority who were looking at equity happened at the very beginning. Same when we moved to the national response, the sort of meta leadership that happens on our level by bringing Kay Hayes in. The second thing is like, we're not gonna let go of what we've learned here. And so the one sort of good thing, well, there's lots of good things about the person who's the leader of the HIV division at CDC, having this sort of uh, sort of national role uh, sort of in the sort of meta leadership over this response is that many of the uh, our new engagements and interactions that we have that is, have informed our work at MPOX will be pulled into CDC um, and we will be working with them closely, really addressing sort of ways that we can calibrate our HIV and other syndemic responses to be more responsive to equity needs. So the answer really is the question answered itself, which is that it needs to be the first thing that we think about, not the second or third thing. And so um, there is there is a, already a concerted effort to sort of take that tractor beam and pull it out of like this White House national response into how we really respond to all the syndemics. So um, and also, I think, um, you know, the important sort of component is like, I, I've got to say, for me, this was my dress rehearsal for an HIV vaccine. It's a very similar population. We've learned lessons about how to how to do this better. And I feel like we're going to pull those into, into the story so we can think about when, when science is able to deliver us an effective HIV vaccine, how can we learn the lessons from MPOX to deliver? And I'll say same lessons um, for how can we do better with HIV testing, treatment, and PrEP. And so all of those things are coming back. And the equity focus, I think, that has already existed has actually been strengthened by the experience that we've had in MPOX. So nothing good about MPOX um, at the end of the day, but the one thing that I think is valuable is that like there's some real important lessons that aren't going to stay in the MPOX column, but are going to be shifted into the other work that we're doing. Excellent. Um, um, uh, keeping uh, our conversation on time, I'm going to take you for that conversation to this question that I have personally is, so the audience here is researchers and community leaders and public health department officials. From where you stand, uh, what are have and what we have learned? What are the priorities for prevention, generally speaking, for STIs? Why? What areas should we be focusing on right now? Yeah. So looking specifically at STI, and I wish I had Leandro on with me because I think this is um, an area for him too. Sort of the, the, the division director for the division of STD prevention. Um, you know, I, I think really um, the lessons here, I think, are a we need to make sure that we adequately resource STD work because it is the front line of so much of what we do. The same can be said for harm reduction for substance users and for sort of mental health. So really thinking about like, how can we take a syndemic point of view to make sure that we're adequately supporting the work where people find us every day? It goes back to that same, that same metric, that same matrix. So like, you know, people seek sexual health services sometimes more than they're going to seek out like PrEP or HIV prevention. They, they seek it in places like community health centers. They seek it in places like sexual health clinics or STD clinics. Like they seek services in pharmacies. How can we do better? Like to be able to do that. We still haven't cracked the code in MPOX. We're still working on that. Um, but like, how can we do better to sort of get vaccine places? How can we accelerate the science Everyone is, and I know you all are precocious with this, doxypep is very interesting. And I think that like there are jurisdictions that are pursuing doxypep. And the question is, when is it ready for prime time in other places? And sort of what does that look like? So how can the science really move us forward into not only like 
good testing and good behavioral strategies, but is there another biomedical way to interrupt this? Is there, is there going to be a future role for men B to interrupt gonococcal transmission? Like what is the, what is um, doxypep going to look like in the future for STIs? And then, you know, finally, policy, policy, policy. There are so many things that are blocking us from being able to do what we need, whether it's like really sort of getting to the, the quick and the core of what we need to do. Like where are the places where like reproductive health is getting impacted? That's going to mess up HIV and STD. It's not just reproductive productive health. And so really identifying like the policy levers and the challenges is critical so that we can um, move the science forward, focus on the humans, make sure that um, we um, really address the places where we can find them. If the policy doesn't shift or goes in the wrong direction, our job is going to become twice as hard. And there's a comment here in the chat about uh, pushing forward that breaking the silos have you demonstrated at the beginning and how we can be flexible and bring the agencies working together. Um, one more question before we let you go. This is very important for, for many of us. You are a public figure. You're a gay man out um, and you're very successful in what you do. How do you navigate your persona, your public identity, yourself, in the federal government and working with public officials? I'll say I was, I'll tell you one of the most confusing things that happened first is a funny story. And then I'll answer that question, which is when Pause Magazine voted me like the celebrity advocate of the year, I was like, I don't know how that happened, but groovy. So I love that I'm being seen as an advocate while in government, which is really, really great. Um, but I think that really it's about, you know, navigating. I mean, I feel like, like I, lead with science and lead with public health, but then also like, I'm not nervous about bringing my identity to the table. Like in this response, that was pretty important. And so I think that, um, that um, it's not always that I'm comfortable in my skin, but I feel like the community that I serve, whether it's the scientists, the, co the community at large, like needed me to do that. And so even though sometimes it's uncomfortable and some of the things that I heard from folks who uh, potentially, aren't big supporters seemed a little harmful or hurtful. I think at the end of the day, um, as I said, um, soon after getting some of the noise um, from people um, around my identity, um, you can't be everyone's hero. You just have to be hero to the people that matter. And so I think that that's sort of a, a, my lesson um, and also the lesson for folks who are comfortable leading with their identity. If they're not comfortable, then they shouldn't. Um, but I think that when you are, when you have someone who's comfortable, I, I feel like this is one of the reasons that I'm here at the White House working, um, that, that um, I was, I think that, that that was used as a really important tool to make sure that uh, communication with the community was good, solid, and in terms um, that they understood. And I think I'm not alone in uh, appreciating your leadership in HIV and, and POX. Thank you so much. And we have come to the conclusion of this webinar, uh, town hall, excuse me, that is presented like a webinar. And uh, you've, been, you've seen right now um, our short survey to provide feedback uh, for us. It's very important for us because, because of your feedback, we invite leaders like Dr. Daskarakis uh, to come to us and help us um, uh, collaborate and continue our work to health equity. Dr. Um, Laskaraki, it's a pleasure meeting you virtually. Thank you for your team uh, effort to bring us all together. Thank you, audience. We appreciate your support. Uh, thank you, Rochelle, and have a good afternoon. Bye.